This is uh, March the 5th, 2005, and we are at the home of uh, Army nurse veteran Martha Graff, uh, and she will be doing an interview uh, with us for the Library of Congress and the Christ Hospital Archives. Martha, can you tell us a little bit about your life as you were doing and about uh, your experiences with the Army? Well, I entered the Army and um, I had my physical in October of 19... 41, 43, I'm sorry. And I entered the Army in, in uh, the 1st of October of 43. I went to uh, Fort Harrison for my basic training, where we learned to make out the diff various forms for the lab, the x-ray, and uh, military courtesy, how to salute, and how to march. We were there for six weeks. Then we were, I was sent to Camp Breckenridge, Kentucky, which is in the southeast, west, southwestern part of Kentucky, and went to Camp Breckenridge. And on uh, December the 25th of 1943, I was sent to the prisoner of war section. We had many German prisoners there because it was not safe to let them go back to their own units. They were brought to the United States. And they, I did understand German. They asked me not to let them know this. I, uh, we had interpreters on the board. We had many prisoners from other countries that were captured by the Germans and given the, chance, the uh, option of either being a shot or going to the front. They chose going to the front, hoping to be captured by the Americans. Most of the men we had then were Rommel's men from the African Corps. Uh, some were the old-time German uh, sergeants. We had uh, interpreters on the ward, so I didn't have to use my knowledge of German, which I was asked not to. Uh, we had many um, other countries represented that had been captured by the Germans. We had French, we had Italians, we had Polish, we had uh, Russians, the Mongolian Russians especially. And uh, the Pol Polish, they had never seen a uh, cornflakes and he thought it was the most valuable thing he'd ever ate and that's all he wanted to eat for all of his meals were cornflakes he'd never seen an orange the Germans didn't have oranges they didn't have these things um, we they got the same food as our GIs on the ward and sometimes they some of them would cry because they knew their families were starving and they were eating this good food I was told to be to watchful of anything unusual and because sometimes uh, they thought there were some irregularities in the camp. And one day I was getting ready for lunch and the commandant of the camp, an American colonel, came to the ward and he stopped at the uh, room of a patient right opposite the doctor's office and I picked up my cape to go to lunch and he raised his hand and gave the Heil Hitler, which was not to be done. So I just turned my cake back and he says, oh, you're coming back from, you're going to lunch? I said, no, I just returned. So I followed him through the ward and he tried to get rid of me. And then I heard him talking on the phone in German and in the army during World War II, every telephone had a written message, only English is spoken on this phone. And then I saw some other things that I thought were peculiar. There was a pastor, a, Luther, a chaplain, and he asked me, uh, he was Lutheran supposedly, and he asked me uh, 
if his daughter wanted to go to uh, learn music, should he go to the uh, Wittenberg Conservatory or Capitol? And I said, well, Chaplain, aren't you in a better position than I to answer that? So uh, I re went, reported to the chief nurse these two irregularities. And one day I was called and told to go to my quarters, put on my dress uniform and go out to the lobby and someone would meet me there. So I went out and I, a, uh, an armed uh, MP stood back at me and asked me if I saw anyone I recognized in the lobby and I said no. So they put me in an armored car and took me over to headquarters, the adjutant general, where I met with the FBI and the Secret Service. And I was telling them about the, cur the uh, colonel, and I told him about the chaplain. I said, I don't think he's the Lutheran chaplain. And some other things that I thought were irregular. And then I went back to my quarters and went on duty. And then the next thing I remembered was a, uh, one of the men, uh, Germans, had a lot of cuts on his hands and apparently had been in an altercation with the, one of the um, guards. And I asked him what happened and he wouldn't say. Then uh, I found the 83rd Division was getting ready to go overseas because we were a staging area. And I found the 83rd Patches in the wastebasket here at the um, prisoner of war section, which I thought was very irregular. And the 83rd had had many accidents as it was. I reported this, and when I went over, I told, they told me that they had checked every place. They couldn't find any church that this chaplain supposedly had had, no um, seminary where he had graduated from, and so they were looking into that. And he came in and went up the steps, and they said, did he see you? And I said, yes, I think he did. So that's, after that, I went back and I, one day I had a phone call and said, keep your nose in your own business or you'll be afraid and you'll be sorry. So uh, my duties there ended in uh, June when I went on uh, leave at home. And while I was home, I, was, I got a letter telling me I was, um, got a promotion to first lieutenant. When I came back, I went on night duty, and I did make rounds at the POW section. And Max, who was the corpsman when I was there, said, I go back to camp. I said, but that's what you want, go ahead. Well, apparently many people think I was coddling the prisoners, and they, I had to make rounds with MPs at night. And uh, he said, well, I see now that you didn't. And uh, so I ended up on, after I came off night duty, I worked on some of the other floor, floors, and one day I had uh, a, an emergency and I went over and talked to the chief nurse, and I ended up in the hospital for a few days, and then they uh, sent me back to duty. And the next day the chief nurse asked me to clear the post and be ready to leave for the 64th field. So I had one day to clear the post and get ready to go overseas. We uh, left at 5 o'clock in the morning and went to Evansville and got the train. And uh, we had to change in Terre Haute. And we got to uh, Fort Dix to join the 64th field. And we were the last ones. And when I was there, they made me as the assistant nurse, the chief nurse. and. Um, I was very pale, so they sent me to have an ex uh, an, a physical examination. And they kept me in the hospital because they thought I was looked too pale. And I spent several months there. And finally, uh, I had some, uh, I had tests and nothing was evident. So they sent me home on leave. And I came back and I went to the medical ward. And I had tests all again, and they couldn't find anything. So I went back to work at Fort Dix. And Fort Dix was a, uh, a 
an orthopedic center. And I was delighted with my training at Christ Hospital because I saw boys that traction for a year. And one boy had a hole in his knee and the orders read to keep it with the soaked with penicillin in this hole in the knee. It had been there so long that I had to soak it for hours to get it out and it was supposed to have been done forever. Um, I, they, I had another boy. They had not been, they hadn't been turned correctly. They hadn't been given back care. Uh, the one boy had a temperature and I asked him, how long has it been since you had a bowel movement? He wanted to tell me and I said, well, how long? I, you know, our old BM, we went around to see if you'd have him in. Well, they had, he had this high temperature and this young nurse that was on the ward said, now just look at it, just look at it. So I gave this boy an enema and his temperature came down. So I would get the boys ready. And, you had to keep the ward clean and you had Saturday morning inspection with white gloves and you had to have your floor had to be polished and if they ran out of polish with the quartermaster it didn't matter you still they wouldn't get their three-day pass if the ward wasn't clean and polished so uh, I cleaned the boys up that were going on pass I'd take them in the utility room and wash their hair for them and uh, help them with their, their uh, uniforms. And then the ones that were left on the weekends, this one boy, his feet were in such terrible condition. And I oiled his feet and I cut his toenails. I took, uh, washed his hair in bed and uh, gave him a bath. And this one girl said, well, we don't give baths to men. And I said, well, what do you do in the army? You don't give a bath to a man. And uh, I cleaned all of them up. And I think I had them in my hand then. They were, this one nurse was telling that she doesn't know what she's doing. So we had General Kirk, who was a Surgeon General of the Army. He was coming for a visit. We had to clean everything up. And being an orthopedic ward, we had an orthopedic cupboard. I had it all clean. And the boys came back from uh, pass. And I opened the cupboard and this chicken flew at me. And I said, who brought this chicken in here? Well, Lieutenant, what are you talking about? They hit the chicken on their way back. And they thought they killed it and thought maybe I'd clean it and, and cook it for them. So I called the mess hall and I said, I have a chicken up here. And I said, you boys are going to clean this cupboard. I've had it cleaned. You're going to have to do it yourself. So they came up and they brought the Italian nationals then that worked. And he took the chicken to the mess hall. And they were mad. They said, Lieutenant, we thought you'd cook it. I said, so you were the ones that did it. Well, you cleaned the cabinet. So General Kirk came and uh, the protocol was that uh, the first person on the, the uh, with the nurse, chief nurse, would call attention and you didn't have to salute, you just stood at attention. So he was checking the boys and they had told me that the, the, uh, the captain on the ward said that his uh, tractions are not right. He says, you fix them. And I said, that's not my job. So uh, General Kirk says, I bet my nurse, he has a, a pair of scissors. And I gave them to him. And then he really, he let into this captain because he hadn't fixed them. And I said to the chief nurse, I said, he told me to do it. And I said, that's really not my job. And she said, no. So uh, he didn't know how. Well, he got really laid out by General Kirk. And I was, I was his nursey for the whole time he was on the board. Well, it's because his wife's a nurse. But uh, afterwards, we had a boy in the one room who had been in, got, got off of the, embarked at Italy. And when you get embarked, they have lines where they clean the mines. 
and you walk between the lines. Well, this kid, 19 years old, didn't do what he was supposed to, and part of his leg was blown. And he had, he was in a body cast, and he was in a private room, and he would sleep, and when he awakened, he would demand his breakfast. He had big uh, holes in his spine where he had not been turned. And they had so many of these that had these uh, sores that uh, they called in the plastic surgeons and they just couldn't get to him. And I said, well, can I treat him? The ward officer said, go ahead. So I turned him over, washed him with the soap, and turned the light, bed light on him. Then I'd paint him with gentian violet, old-fashioned thing that we did. By the time they got around to him, he was uh, cured. And they asked me what I did. And I said, well, I just used uh, regular soap and water and put the light on him and then painted it with gentian violet and made him turn over. So he was such a, a pill, and I decided he's, so the, the um, Catholic chaplain came and said, Lieutenant, move him out with the other boys, which I did. And I said, Joe, you'll either wake up and eat when the rest of us of them eat, or you'll go without. So we had a, what they called a, a, a board uh, chief, and she was the same rank as I. And she went down to the chief nurse and said, I had a pa an unconscious patient. So Major Miller came up and she says, where's this patient? I said, what do you mean? I said, Joe? I said, we're teaching him a lesson. I said, Joe has been given the privilege to sleep all day and eat whenever he wants. And I said, this is not a hotel. So he woke up. she got so angry with this, n this nurse. So then one day, um, one of the boys came to me and asked if he could have his uniform to take it to the Red Cross and uh, iron it. Well, they're not allowed their uniforms until they have a pass. So this gal was standing, she stood there, and she says, you can't have it. He said, I was talking to the lieutenant. Oh, oh. She says, you, you just hurt me. I'm going to court-martial you. And I looked at her. So I told him, no, I said, I'll take your uniform home tonight and I'll press it for you. So she had him court-martial. I had orders to go to a England general in Atlantic City. And I went to this court-martial and I said, no, I'm not going to court-martial that young man. I said, he asked me a question. And before I could answer, she answered for him. And I said, I am not going to court-martial this young man. That is ridiculous. Mary says, I'm going to faint. I'm going to faint. She went against me, and I said, Mary, there is no reason for you to court-martial this young man. He asked me a question, and it was my duty to answer. And I was going to take his uniform home and press it for him. So he finally wasn't court-martialed. He had tears in his eyes, and he said, I would hug you, Lieutenant, but I know I'm not supposed to. I said, just shake hands. So I went down and told the chief nurse, because they were holding up everything for me, and she said, she's just got to learn her lesson. And uh, she said, she has no right to do these things. So then I went to England General. When I got there, we were in hotels. And I was in the medical hotel, and this was a center for amputees and uh, paraplegics. We had one quadruple amputee, and it was kind of a shock when you first went there to see all these boys without limbs, and then it became natural to you. And I had uh, patients who, one young man had a knee off and was blind and we would send him around to cheer the other patients up. And then I had, uh, we had some uh, boys who were, had been, 
POW said the Japanese. We had young, young one, one young man who had been uh, on the Bataan Death March, one of the few survivors, and he would not talk. And one Sunday, we had uh, a desk out in the hall that the chaplains would use. And this young man came up to me and started talking. And I had medications to give. And Father said, Father Kennedy said, stop. They had not been able to get him to talk to anybody, not the, not the psychiatrist, psychologist, medical, no one. And he talked to me for an hour, telling about how it was with the Bataan Death March and talked about his buddies that stumbled and were stabbed or shot. And he said to me, you know what I want? And I said, what? And he said, some venison. I said, venison? What do you mean, venison? I said, where are you from? He said, Minnesota. I said, well, we'll find anything for you, but I don't think Atlantic City has any venison at this point. So uh, then we had some females who had been with prisoners of the Japs. And uh, they didn't want to talk too much, but we had them all as patients. And then I got orders to go back to, uh, the war was over and they asked me if I'd like to sign up again. But I was having these problems with my uh, menstrual problems. And I said, no, I, th I think I've had enough time. But in August before, before that, I got made captain just before I got out. So I went back, to, where did they send me? Back to Fort Dix. And uh, my, my your, your chart travels everywhere with you. And it's like this, you know. And this captain said to me, uh, you know, we can't uh, afford to give everybody uh, a medical discharge. I said, I'm going to ask you for a discharge. Because when I was on leave one time, I came to Miss Cincinnati and saw a doctor who told me I had a mass in my side and get out of that army as soon as possible and have come home and have it taken care of. And he said, uh, I said, I haven't asked you for anything. I just want to get out of here. So I was, they take you before a board. If you, you can't do overseas duty, you're on limited duty. And you go before a board, which is a joke, and they say, you can do limited duty, but you can't go overseas. Now he says, uh, oh, she can do full duty, she's okay. And uh, I took my clothes, my footlocker over to the quartermaster and shipped it home. I thought I was getting out. So while I was gone, I had a call and they said, You're, they've been calling for you. So there was a doctor there and wanted to examine me. I said, why? You'll just tell me it's all in my head like everybody else. He says, young lady, I'm a gynecologist and you're the first gen case I've had since I've been in the service. So he examined me and he said, uh, have you ever had a barium enema? And I said, yes. He said, when? I said, a year ago. He said, where? I said, in this hospital. He said, what did it show? I said, well, the report's on that chart and showed a bass then. And this uh, officer said, well, why didn't you tell me? I said, Captain, I'm not supposed to know what's on that chart. I can be court-martialed for reading it. You've been in had the possession of that chart for a month, and you haven't read it. All you see is this thick business with a note of, of um, all in our psychi psychiatric. So I had to, he said, well, you're not going home. He says, you're going to have some tests. So they sent me down for a barium enema. I was down there all day. And I got back, they couldn't get the barium through. I had an obstruction. So I got back to my bed and they were having some grand rounds. So the Colonel says, where have you been? You're supposed to be here. I said, x-ray. You went to x-ray this morning? I said, yes, sir. When they find, I said, well, they can't get the barium through the cecum. They left my bed, and the next thing I knew, the nurse says, come up to the office. 
and they said, we want you to sign papers. We don't know what you have. It could be cancer. We want permission to do whatever we have to do. So I get back to the ward, and there's this harpist playing. <laughs> I thought, oh, Lord. <laughs> so this nurse said, uh, you think you could uh, prepare yourself? I said, I'm good, but I'm not that good. <laughs> so she shaved me, and then I had to have an enema. We had some very nice black nurses next to me. They said, come on, we'll give you the enema. So I went to surgery the next morning at 7 o'clock. And uh, I didn't get back until about 4 in the afternoon. And uh, he came in, and I really was sick, and I had uh, a special nurse for an, a night duty. And then next morning they were trying to put some more IVs in, and they couldn't find any veins. And I was so sick. So when I finished, he said, well, you're cured. And I went home on leave. You get so much time off when you had surgery. And uh, I came back, and this doctor, who was the gynecologist, because he was there on temporary duty, wasn't allowed to uh, do the surgery. He said, I'm going to tell you this. He said, I could be court martial, but when you get out of here, you get home and you get yourself in the hands of a good GYN man. I said, why? He said, you're going to have more trouble. And then the OR nurse, that was a friend of mine, and she says, Martha, don't ever tell him I told you, but she said, during surgery, the captain said, this is off the record. Everything said in surgery should be written. <laughs> no one can help this girl anymore. It's too late, but I don't want to be involved. So uh, I came home, and I was home about, I think I got home in late October, and I, in November, I had a, almost a hemorrhage. But they had given me medicine, my, the doctor here in Cincinnati had given me enough medication to control the bleeding and the uh, pain. What I had was endometriosis, severe. So I told him when I came here that and asked if I could have a job. I told Miss Manthe, I said, I'll, I did have some surgery and I may have more trouble. So I came back to work the first of January and in February I had to have a DNC. I saw Dr. Eddie and Dr. Meek. And then in May, I called him. I got up one morning and just hemorrhaged all over the place. So I called him. This shouldn't be on TV. On the, what? Should it be on here? Mm -hmm. Anyway, they uh, sent Dr. Uh, sent uh, someone from the lab over to check my blood. They thought I might have to have an infusion, a blood infusion. And uh, so I had surgery in May, and he said, you call your parents. Well, I called my mother said, you can't have surgery, I'm going to have a permanent. I said, well, call, you have your party and I'll have mine. So they got here just as uh, I was going to the OR. And uh, afterwards, Dr. Eddie talked to my mother, and they had to remove everything, complete hysterectomy, including the, uh, the cervix, tubes, ovary was left. And they said that it was such a mess. They were furious, Dr. Eddie said, we want to write to the Army and get your records. He said they had pulled my uterus loose from the, where it was attached to the bowel, mm -hmm. and he said, I have, they ruined my brother. I have a chance to get back to them. So when you go through um, discharge, you put down anything that happened to you in the service, and I just put down the fact I had an ovary removed. So I got a letter that I had 10% uh, 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 and I would get $25 a month as a 10% disability. 
So uh, I got home from after I had my surgery, and I went home by ambulance. And I was in bed for three weeks. I wasn't allowed to walk or anything. And I had a, a call from the Red Cross, and she said uh, we wanted to see if that if everything was all right. I said, well, funny you called. I just had a lot more surgery, and told her I put the Red Cross down. You could put anyone down as your representative, as being a female. I thought I'll put the Red Cross, and she says, well, I'm going to call your doctor. He didn't want to tell her anything, so I told him to go ahead. And they got my records from the Army, and they were furious. And the Red Cross through the VA, I had a letter from them. And when I came back to Cincinnati, I was to have a physical. So they gave me 100 percent disability as long as I was off until I went back to work. And uh, then I had my uh, I had to go down to the VA, and I had a, a, a physical. It so happened the two doctors were the residents when I had my surgery, and they knew exactly. So I got a uh, permanent 50 percent disability with a K award. So I get a nice pension from the VA each month. And uh, so I, they wanted me to stay in, but no way could I have stayed in and, and lived. Mm -hmm. So and I went back to Christ, and uh, when I went back, they were using penicillin uh, every three hours. We had to mix the powder, mm -hmm. and it seemed to me that everybody, I was a nurse on two, two North. And all I did all day was sit and mix his penicillin. And Dr. Rudd, he was a surgeon over at uh, UC. Altmaier, maybe? Altmaier came in. He says, Miss Graff, is that all you do? I said, isn't this ridiculous? I didn't know he was a penicillin uh, officer for the city. <laughs> I said, you know, a, pro a graduate RN spending a whole day I think if they had a penicillin lab, they could have one person mix this and have better control, and then they should have uh, dry uh, autoclave syringes, because with you boiling them, you can not you can get them and contaminate. He says that's a good idea. He left here, went to Dr. Steele's office, noontime. I came and says, you find a room, write the procedure, order the stuff, and you start the penicillin lab, which I did. Of course, the nursing office couldn't stand seeing me in there. They think doing nothing when you're getting all this together, you know. And I said, we could do it for every floor and save all of these nurses time. So I, um, I had the penicillin lab, and I had cards. And I had a box, and each person would bring down their order, and we would fill it. And I had a nurse aide who washed syringes, and I wrote an article for the uh, American Hospital Association, and then I was written up by the the Enquirer, and I said we have this uh, these this penicillin that's oil based, and it's so hard to get out of the of the syringes, so P and G sent over some stuff for us to try, and that cleaned the syringes. So we had those, and then finally um, they asked me to go back to the o the ER. I went down, and I was shocked at how filthy it was. The, the dressing cart had old bulbs on it. Uh, it was filthy, and I found they were putting student nurses on evenings with absolutely no uh, information. So I wrote a, a little book of instruction. I wrote and then a procedure book, and uh, the state came in and they said, we'd like to see what you're doing. And they said, 
well, I don't think the state knew you were doing this. This is a good idea. So I started with a little bit and a little more. I thought they have to have more information, not just throw them into the bulls without any information, right? Right. And so then I had procedure books and policy books, and everybody was writing and wanting copies of it. And when uh, they opened Bethesda North, uh, she wanted me to give, bring my policy books and procedure manuals out to give it to them. And I said, well, I think you better ask your uh, chief nurse to call my chief nurse before we do things like that, which made them mad. But I think Marion Goebel took them and got copies made. But we had uh, requests from all over for my procedure and policy manuals. So then I worked in emergency for, what, 35 years. And then in the end they took us out of nursing and put us under administration. And administration meant uh, the pharmacist, Wars Cross, and we had a new doctor, amen, and uh, he wanted young people. He wanted me to fire Miss Hallerman because she was old. I said, I will not. You do not fire people because of their age. Well, he had a nurse over G, a Jewish that he wanted to bring in. So one day uh, he said, um, well, are you busy tomorrow? And I said, well, no. Well, he said, uh, Buddy wants to see us at 3.30. So we went up and Buddy hemmed and hawed and finally he said, we're going to eliminate your job. I said, oh. I said, well, it's strange after all these years that you just think you have failed. Oh, you haven't failed. We're just going to eliminate it. And I, he says, you want to go to another hospital? We understand. I said, you want me out of here? No, Miss Diggin wants to talk to you. So I went up to see Miss Diggin. I was shocked. And she said, they're out of their minds. I said, well, Miss Diggin, I told you that uh, when, I, when they separated us, I told you I'd always been under nursing, but I've always been in the ER. And she said, I know. She said, I've already got your office here. Been waiting for you to come home. So I, but I had to go on nights and then I went on evenings as director of nursing on evenings. But when I was in the office, I said to them, to Betty Wiggs and Mr. Cross, I said, I've seen this happen to other people, but I've also been here long enough to see the same thing happen to those who did it. And that came true. <laughs> Forrest Cross was fired. The doctor was fired. And the other doctors under him, they charged him with not paying them and he was under fire. So I came out better in the end. Uh, that's true. So you were, except for your own health problems, you were pretty happy with your experiences in the service? Yes, yes, yes. And it sounded and like- And I'm a member of the uh, Women in Military Sister, Sis Military Service, and I'm a charter member. Oh, are you? Yes, mm -hmm. my name's on the, mm -hmm. the list there. Yeah, I, there's several. Um, do you know Bonnie Rost? She was a charter member, I think. Bonnie who? Rost, R-O-S-T. Yeah. Okay. Um, you were saying before I turned the tape recorder on uh, a story about um, uh, the German uh, prisoners' patients um, learning that you knew German. Yes, they couldn't believe that anybody in the United States could learn a folk song in school. And they told me, they said they were told that New York had been blown off the map, and they said, we see by our own eyes New York's there. And they were told that uh, in the West, beyond New York, it was just like the old Wild West. And they said, we can see that it isn't. They told us lies. 
and several of them spoke beautiful English because they were educated in England. And uh, the, the Germans in Germany, only the boys at the front or the prisoners of war were allowed any kind of sweets. And this one boy came to me and he says, Lieutenant, look at this. My family went without sugar and butter for months to make these and you, they're he says, I want you to try it. You, you wouldn't give them to your dogs. And he says, it hurt us that our families were without all this time. And uh, one of them came to me and says, well, my, my uh, home was blown up. I said, so? He says, well, how did America get into the war? I said, you don't know? Well, see, they had the New York Times printed in German but they only gave them what they wanted them to know. And then they made out cards that were sent to Texas and sent back to their countries to tell them that they were prisoners of war. The Russians would never tell them because they knew their families would be killed if they were caught uh, fighting with the Russians. And then there was a German, an, an American uh, major who happened to be Jewish. He was over there and he said, do you know that over there in Africa there was a German general who asked to stop the war. He said, if you'll take your injured and our injured, we have nothing to give them. We don't have any food or medicine for them. They'll just stop the war and you take them. And that's what they did. But these are the stories that you never hear about, you know. And then when I got to... Um, I got back to, oh, and I got to Fort Dix, and then they were repatriating some of the patients. They had armed guards around the Russians because as soon as they get on ship, on ship, they would jump off to try to commit suicide because they knew as soon as they got home they would be killed for making, making them to fight with the Germans. And we had a terrible time because if you don't get their prisoners back, you won't get your men back. So it was quite a time. And uh, when I got out of Camp Breckenridge, I was very happy. I had a sigh of relief. Yes, it was a very tense time for me. And when they put the armed guards around the nurses' quarters, I was a night nurse. Evening super, night supervisor. And the kids were in the room. One of them said, What time is it? And the voice from outside said, Nine o'clock. So the guard was peeking in the windows. And the girls were sitting on the floor in their underwear because it was so hot. So I went out after him. And he says, Gravy's got a gun. I said, Well, he's not going to use it on me. So I called the administrative officer of the day. And he laughed and he said, Well, I'd like to have that job. And I said, This is nothing to laugh at. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a very uh, anxious time, very anxious. Is there anything else you would like to add to your I I can't think of anything. Memories? I had uh, a couple from church that visited me, and uh, one day Bill said, Did, didn't you know about Dorothea? And I said, no. Dorothea was a war bride, bride, and she said that they had a camp, her father had a cabin on the Black Sea, and they heard the Russians coming, and they hurried home to their home on the farm. And she was a little girl, and she said, uh, I had a little wagon, and it was on the dirt road, and I was riding my wagon, and I heard a noise behind me, and I got over on the side of the road, and here was the Americans coming. And she said they just laughed at her and they gave her candy. And she said she hadn't had any candy. And then her father spoke English and came out and told them the house across the way was just evacuated by a Russian or uh, German general. And he said it's, uh, it's empty and you can have it. So they moved in as her headquarters. 
and she said that by, they gave my mother some sugar and flour from the mess hall and eggs and oranges, and she said, I've never had an orange. Germany had no fruit, they didn't have it, and uh, very little of anything. So she said that uh, apparently she then met her husband, and Dorothea has absolutely no accent. And she says, well, in Germany now, in the fifth, fourth grade, they're teaching English, that's a must. And so she asked me about my days, and she said, you should write a book. And I said, no, it's all up here, that's all. And I've never talked about it until the last couple of years, because uh, it wasn't written up in, in my uh, record. I asked when I was, went through discharge. He said, no, there's nothing about it, which I didn't expect it to be. Oh, you mean your experiences with the prisoners of war that you talked about? Uh -huh. Yeah. So is there anything else you'd like to know? Well, tell us a little bit about your time, uh, well this is going backwards, but about your times with Christ Hospital oh, as well, a student. As a student. I, when I was at Christ Hospital, I went to the emergency room. When I came back from the service, I went back to emergency. And uh, as I say, I cleaned it up, I think. And there was one gal that was upset that I was made supervisor because uh, she thought she should be. And uh, she left and went with uh, one of the industrial companies. And then we got different people in and I cleaned it up and then I started, as I say, when I was surprised that students were on evenings with that little or no education. So that's when I started writing manuals and uh, sometimes the, the, uh, the interns didn't make very good uh, Well, they didn't make good judgments, huh? They didn't make much money at all either. And nor did they make good judgments. No, they didn't. There was one gal was a nurse, and the intern saw her and said, "Oh, nothing's wrong." And I said to her, "I thought she had a a um, oh shoot." What do you call that? Pregnancy. Tubal pregnancy. Yeah, tubal, tubular pregnancy. So I said, what surgeon would you like to see? And she told me. And I called him down. He said, get her ready for surgery. And she did. She had pain up in her shoulder, which is indicative of free air. And uh, so the interns, I guess, didn't like me very much. I, one of them came to see me a couple of years ago, Bob Anderson, and he said, you know, uh, the fellows didn't like you because you uh, stepped on their toes. I said, well, I saved their heels sometimes, too. I like that. I have a question. How did you happen to come to Christ Hospital School of Nursing from Newark? Well, I had a friend, Ruth Spitzer, went to my church. and. Um, it was one of the cheapest at the time during the Depression, and I had to have an insurance policy that would pay my way. Uh -huh. So I, uh, I came down for an interview, and then I came and I found out I couldn't come in until January class. But it's interesting, I had cadet nurses when I was at Fort Dix, and uh, there's a Christ Hospital in Jersey City. We had cadets from uh, what's that hospital in, in uh, New York, big one. Sloan Kettering is huh? that in New York. Sloan Kettering. Bellevue. Bellevue. Okay. Bellevue nurses and several of the other hospitals. Bellevue nurses says we don't take care of boys. 
men. I said, what are you doing here then? I, and they had no, and no knowledge, these are seniors, of sterile technique. I had to teach them sterile technique. They knew nothing about anything. And then they was at Christ Hospital from Jersey City. And I didn't know there was another Christ Hospital in the United States. So one girl, one day this girl said, you know, I don't know what you're thinking about me. And I said, young lady, it's a good thing you don't. <laughs> and I said, I, I had wonderful training. They said, where are you from? Cincinnati. Oh, well, that's, I said, well, I had better training than you, believe me. So uh, one of them didn't want to give baths to, to men. And I said, well, then you have no business being here. So the, their person in charge of them came. And she said, Lieutenant, she said, uh, you just tell these girls anything they need to know. And I said, well, there's a lot they're, they're, they're lacking, I'll tell you. So uh, finally, I got you know, some of them taught stellar technique, but I still wasn't happy with them. And uh, the boys, one boy uh, especially bothered me, and he had been a prisoner of the Germans. And he had no expression on his face. And he had had some surgery, which ankylosed his knee. It was stiff, and he didn't like it. But when the doctors saw it, they were amazed at the type of surgery that he had had in Germany, even though he was a, a prisoner of war. But he wasn't happy with it. So uh, there were boys in traction for over a year which to me was just impossible. But since I've been home, I've noticed now all of my uh, friends who were nurses with me are gone. I'm about the only one in my community left. And I had one that was here in Cincinnati. I used to, she was a Jewish hospital nurse. And uh, she, call, that's, she called me and said she was very ill with cancer and she died. So I have no more correspondence. Every year I get a letter from a husband or a friend and, or a sister and saying that so-and-so died that year. So uh, I'm one of the few remaining in my group. So when I had my surgery on my cheek, I went, it was up here at Franciscan because uh, Dr. Dawson didn't go to Christ and the weather was so Bad. Dr. D Dr. Brueggemann says, well, go ahead. And I was very pleased, but there was an, a uh, Christ Hospital nurse there, younger girl, and she came in and talked to me, and somehow they all found out that I guess Kathy, my, I call her my niece, Elsie's daughter, went with me and told them, I, yeah, she's a, an RN and a, a war veteran. She was an Army nurse. So when I get into the operating room, I can't have uh, general anesthetic because I have carotid artery occlusion. But they gave the IVs, and I had to have two bags, two piggybacks of, of uh, antibiotics because I have a total knee replacement and I have a mitral valve interlapse. So I had those and went in. And I was very impressed with their facilities and their efficiency. Good. It really was. So I was in the uh, operating room, and I thought I was talking through the surgery, but it was while they were waiting for the path report, because they had to do frozen sections. And they said, somebody said something about a veteran, and the doctor said, are you an, a veteran? And I said, World War II. And they all said, we've never talked to a veteran of World War II. Uh, what did you do? And I said, well, I told them so. They all wanted to know if they could shake my hand. And the doctor said, I didn't know I had a veteran in my office. He's young. <laughs> and I guess there aren't too many veterans around. Well, this is one reason that uh, I just got a letter, as a matter of fact, with some of these uh, forms that they send out, uh, saying that they, they really, really want to gear in on World War II and the very, very, very rare World War One, there are a few, 
uh, and veterans, and uh, then Korea, you know, and so forth. But uh, the type of stories you are telling uh, are just um, uh, very unique and also, I think, very valuable. Well, I remember the day of the invasion. They came through quarters and more, and woke us up and says the invasion started. Mm -hmm. And to fool the uh, Germans, what they did was they outfitted some troops with white, all white costumes. So they thought they were coming in from the north. And uh, they didn't dream they were coming in through uh, the, be the Utah Beach. And uh, so, but they got slaughtered anyway. Yeah. Now, my cousin was there after the war. My unit followed General Patton, and they got caught in the Belgian bulge because they kept writing to me wherever they were and uh, asking me to send them, they were in England, send us some toilet paper. So I put a few pieces in a letter to send it to them. And uh, so they, uh, they said that when they got back, they had to leave everything. And a 64th field is intense. And when they got back, the only thing changed was the one girl's wedding picture. And it was just, they had looked at it and <coughs> put it down and everything was left the way it was. Wow. So then I went to meet my uh, my ward officer. I was at the ANA convention in uh, Chicago, and I knew that Captain Zipman had a, um, an office in Chicago. So I called him up and I said to his office girl, I'm sure he doesn't remember me, but I was in the <coughs> army with him at Camp Breckenridge. Now this voice gets on the phone and says, what do you mean I don't remember you? He says, well, come over and see me. I said, well, I don't know where you are. He says, where are you? I said, the Palmer House. He said, I'm across the street. And he said, can you come over tomorrow at about 4 o'clock? And I said, sure. So I went over and went in and sat down. And he said, do you ever hear from Max? And I said, no. Max said he was in love with you. I said, Max would say anything to get it. And he said, you know what? Because you spoke such good German, they thought that Hitler had sent you over there to uh, spy on them. But you know, I've lost my German because you don't use it. You have to use it all the time. Did you learn that in the Cincinnati schools? No, Newark. Oh, Newark, that's right. You were in Newark. Uh -huh. That's right. Newark High School. Huh. And. Uh, we have a, a very uh, active class. <coughs> I went to my 25th anniversary, my 50th anniversary, and my 60th anniversary. Wow. And I haven't been back since. And at my 60th, uh, the, the fellow in, who was the master of ceremony says, I'm going to talk about you. And I said, why? Because I think it's something honorable. And he says, Captain Martha Graff. And I said, I said, Vic, that's been years ago. He says, I don't care. You didn't find many female captains. <laughs> and I said, well, the chief of the whole Army Nurse Corps was just a colonel. And I said, uh, they didn't have generals and for the nurses until this, these past wars. And they have elevated them to a general. And uh, then I have a, a young man that's my cousin on my fa father's side that never recognized me before because he was a little higher up than we. And he said, and she's my cousin. I said, well, Howard, that's the first time you ever admitted it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, uh -huh. Now, Melanie Garner from Over Christ, she um, had relayed to me that she wasn't too sure about the um, nursing cadets. Now, exactly what was it? How did somebody... Well, if they, <clears throat> they would pay their way through nursing, if they would spend a year, their last year, on a, um, a base, 
and that's how they got it. And they wore their, they had uniforms, gray and uh, red. But uh, I don't know how much good they certainly didn't help us out any. Well, did Christ actually participate? Oh, yes. Did they? Okay. Yes, because that's one reason that we had to move out of the dorm graduates. They had a couple that lived in that had uh, the uh, suites. And then I lived at, uh, when I came back from the service, I lived at uh, Sunnyside or the Known House, which is now doctor's offices. And, and then in uh, 68, Miss uh, Williamson and Dr. Larrick asked me if I would move into the director's apartment just so that Miss Dum uh, retired. So there would be a, a nurse, a graduate in there. So I lived on the second floor and then they moved me up to the sixth floor because they were redoing the dorm at the time. And uh, <clears throat> they said that I'd have to buy my own furniture. So I bought my living room furniture and my bedroom and uh, I had a di little dinette set in the kitchen, and I had to buy a refrigerator and a range. And uh, I got it, and Helen says, we'll go down to uh, Shelato's and have the, um, the designer. And she came out, and we measured the room, what I could have, and I had green carpet up there. So I bought that sofa, and I had it. I sit in the in the furniture, and then I have it covered in the collar I want. And I had that, and then I had uh, gold chairs with it at the time. And uh, I had to bring my parents to, when I left the emergency room. They also said you have to move out of the apartment. So <clears throat> I uh, came around looking for apartments, and the kid Elsie and her kids wanted me on this side so they could look after me. So we went all over and I kept coming back to this because I thought the grounds looked nicer. Yes. Yes. And they, I've been here 26 years. Go oh, ahead. Really? It's been that long. Hmm? I can't believe it's been that long. Yeah. That's amazing. They've been very good to me. It's very nice. Very and nice. Uh, I needed new carpeting. I had fallen. Oh, I have osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. And uh, you name it, I have it. And I fell and injured my neck, first of all. And the carpet I had, they did, had not changed the pad when they put it in.